<laughs> right. Oh, thank you for sharing. So this is a flyer. Uh, I hope you will see it. So this is a discussion on symbolism. Manji is this Hakenkreutz, swastika, or Christian cross. So we will start uh, in a fi- uh, couple of minutes, and uh, I'm just correcting a little bit of, uh, I mean, the Facebook post. So hopefully some of the posts will change, but I'm not too sure everything changed or not. So, uh, but anyhow, uh, so if you missed it, I, I hope uh, this will help people to watch what happens. And uh, so anyway, uh, so we start uh, in a minute. And today we have uh, Jeff Kelman, uh, who would be the one of the speakers to present his view on this uh, today, that uh, is Hakenkreutz, Swastika, and the Christian Cross. That's really the title itself, his MA uh, thesis. And uh, I'd like to actually congratulate him, his uh, achievement at the same time. So with the honor and uh, uh, gratitude and respect to you, uh, Jeff, I'd like to uh, invite you to be a uh, first speaker. But yet before that, we wanted to continue. And uh, so the uh, today also, we should be uh, res- getting some response from the Greta Elvogen. Uh, she's uh, the Holocaust survivor, but also she has been my uh, also uh, what do you call it, um, site team <laughs> when I was at the New York Theological Seminary writing on the swastika, the Buddhist swastika, Hitler's cross later on become the book. So so she was uh, a lot of advising to me and then the part of her poem, I'm sure she will share later on. That would be something that I uh, wanted to hear. And then the Rabbi Joseph Tadaznik, I don't know when he can come today because of a Palestinian situation. Uh, he's been always busy for that, uh, uh, for the, that kind of community voices. So he's always giving the community voices to such situations. And uh, but uh, also he was very um, uh, very good. I know him for twenty seven years, I guess, ever since I came to New York. So so we work working together in many parts and in a part of the interface uh, community as well. And uh, today also we have um, uh, Adam Weitzman. So he's a producer of the film called Manji. Later we will introduce. And uh, Yosuke, uh, together with uh, Yosuke Kiname, who is a director and camera person for the film, and so they will be both presenting. And uh, I'm glad. I'm also like to express my thank you for taking, uh, you know, decide to have this project. It's a very controversial project in one way, but then also very important project to. Uh, foster the dialogue and then the understand, mutual understanding, cultural differences, beyond the cultural difference or religious differences and so forth. So it's a challenging part, I believe. So, uh, so uh, they both are on 30s and very young. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, from I'm now 60, <laughs> unbelievable, but <laughs> so um, from that sense, it's pretty young. And so uh, I'm like to support as much and uh, so that's uh, things and then today's uh, event itself is uh, uh, sponsored by Hewa Peace and Reconciliation Foundation New York uh, so I'm actually president of this and the founder of this organization as well so basically we are uh, what do you call it um, try to help to create the peace and then the, you know to do that we need to have more dialogue and understandings and uh, so um, and also again I we also use uh, some holocaust uh, is part of I mean sorry Hiroshima part as a uh, uh, Hiroshima Nagasaki atomic bombing that's part of the things that I've been doing for many years so kind of proactive peace building is something that we are interested in doing it so anyway welcome to everyone to join us today so I guess the time is running so maybe we we'll just start from uh, Jeff Kalman and uh, uh, oh, sorry could you, if you don't mind can you introduce yourself because uh, somehow I can't see the script that I have here <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And um, 
Thank you, uh, Reverend Dr. Tike Nakagaki. It's been it's been a joy to just have our discussions and uh, on this specific, very detailed, very sensitive uh, subject uh, for sure. And and you know, thank you to the, he the Haywood Peace and Re Reconciliation Foundation and what we put together there. Uh, I think this is a very important topic, uh, but also a topic that um, is very relevant and pertinent to. to to especially right now, what we see when, uh, as some of our you know, viewers or listeners or just some of the people on this call might be aware, uh, there's clearly uh, you know, a relevance when legislation is being discussed that would imminently uh, you know, and immediately impact uh, potentially how uh, some of these symbols uh, might be able to be presented or and, you know, interpreted and, and everything there. So uh, without further ado. Um, Do you want to show yourself <laughs> first, maybe, so oh. people can see who you are first, probably, and then the, yeah, you can start from there. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> um, can everybody see me now? You can see me. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, my, my name is Jeff Kelman. I have recently completed a, a master's uh, thesis and a master's program in Holocaust and Genocide Studies, uh, specifically at uh, Gratz College. Uh, my master's thesis is titled The Hockenkreis, Swastika, and Christian uh, Cross, um, and just has submitted it uh, for grading and all that uh, back in April, and have uh, finished up the program for graduation in uh, August. So uh, just just finished that. I've been working on it for some time. I've, I've worked with uh, TK here in, in some ways, just in our conversations, as well as uh, Stephen Heller and some other individuals uh, in the space. But uh, yeah. All right, and then uh, whenever we're ready, um, I can kind of share my screen and get started from there. Okay, <laughs> great. So yeah, please do. And then the, before you start going, uh, so the uh, those who are here now, uh, could you oh, sorry, but some noise around me, sorry. But um, can you uh, share with your Facebook? Uh, it seems like uh, people have difficult time for coming to the Zoom. So we we'll try to ask people to share this link uh, if you watch this. So I appreciate it very much if you can share it. Thank you. And uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> if you don't mind, Jeff, can you start? And uh, yeah. Excellent, all right. Let me hit share screen. All right, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Perfect. Beautiful. Um, and just a quick housekeeping note. Um, I, I think we could do this a couple of different ways we discussed, but uh, if we want to just keep, uh, you know, questions perhaps uh, towards the end, uh, you know, at, at that point we can we can go over any particular questions. Uh, if mm -hmm. there's something burning, we want to come up in between. We, we can we can look at that, but uh, we, we can have a period at the end for that. I think we have plenty of time. Um, also, if you want to put it in the chat box. Uh, we can also take a look at those and address them as they may come in. All right. Uh, so as I mentioned here, uh, my, my thesis is, of course, called Hakenkreuz, Swastika, and the Christian Cross. Uh, one of the first things when looking at these, there's a couple different ways to, to talk about these. There's the images themselves, but there's also words and the words that we use to describe these particular symbols or shapes. And as we'll find out, words matter a whole heck of a lot, specifically as it regards to context, the context in which we are looking at these symbols and talking about these symbols and uh, the reverence some individuals may have for them or the disgust that others may have. And the key there is understanding really what uh, you know specific a symbol we're talking about uh, because two people could use the same word and mean very different things. For example, something as simple as sick, just this for a little innocuous word, but it could be this. It could mean that you're not feeling well, that uh, you're not in a good situation there. Hopefully everybody's healthy out there. Or it could be this. It could be sick. That's awesome. I mean, that's ill, you know, any number of these different words there. So I think when we're talking about a word, it's important to understand the context again and start really with definitions. Uh, when two people are using different words and they're understanding it in a different sense, beginning with how you interpret that word, or more importantly, how you define that word is critical. So I'd like to start with these three different uh, definitions. Uh, I define Hakenkreuz, swastika, and the cross. Hakenkreuz, a German word from the original German, uh, means taken from Haken, hook, together with Kreuz, cross, to form hooked cross. 
Hagenkreuz is the word for this uh, swastika looking, I'll say here, symbol. Uh, so it has that aesthetic similarity. And it's the one that, of course, we all know used by Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party in Germany. Swastika, uh, on the other hand, comes from the Sanskrit, uh, linguistically a monogrammatic sign of four branches of which the ends are curved at right angles. The name signifying literally benediction or good augury, a symbol of auspiciousness used by Jain, Hindu, a Buddhist, and countless other peoples dating back many, many, many years. And it, again, we can also use uh, somewhat synonymously for this sort of word, uh, manji, and of course, Japanese, wan from Chinese and what have you. Um, and there's also different pronunciation of the word swastika itself. It could be a swastika, it could be su su uh, swastika with a more V sound, and a few different here. But for the most part, at least throughout this talk, I'll be using the word uh, swastika uh, in, in one sense, and then Hakenkreuz in another, and I'll go into those uh, in terms of what I mean by those a little bit more in, in a moment. Cross now, of course, uh, being the primary symbol of most sects of Christianity, um, and this is simply composed visually of two intersecting uh, lines. Now, going further into the words here, we have to understand that there's a shape and a symbol. And these two things are, are not the same. A shape, of course, is a simple form in space, uh, something as simple as you know, the plus sign on your uh, keyboard, uh, in contrast, of course, to the minus, is just aesthetically very similar to a cross. However, a plus by itself doesn't have any sort of meaning, doesn't have any emotions, doesn't have any uh, attachment to it uh, by anybody. Whereas a cross uh, or a Hockenkreuz or a Coca-Cola symbol even, any number of other items there visually uh, are a symbol in that they hold meaning and emotional attachment and a connotation uh, to them. Now, looking at this, this first symbol, the, the Hockenkreuz or hooked cross if we're translating into English. This, is, this here is the, one of the most powerful graphic uh, images uh, through in uh, the past several hundred years, if not through much of history. Uh, not just the, uh, uh, the, the Nazi usage here, but the symbol more generally. Hitler was very much aware of uh, you know, how powerful the symbol was uh, in terms of how it was used throughout uh, you know, various different uh, cultures and places and was able to put this together with a color aesthetic that was uh, uh, very uh, you know, appealing or of course terrifying, depending on, on the point of view at the time. Now more Hakenkreuz and symbols, just to look at these, we have the Nationalsozialistische DAP, the Nazi party's uh, key symbol here used in different cases. Uh, as we'll discuss a little bit later as well, uh, you'll see that in many cases, this symbol is tilted to a 45 degree angle um, and it's, uh, if you can see my mouse looking like that. And then on this other symbol here, this is Hitler's own personal standard. So you know, his flag, if you were uh, on a personal basis, uses similar colors and a, a similar shape, but it's actually uh, upright. It's not that 45 degree angle. So as we'll learn looking at this, you'll see that it's very difficult to find that a consistent rule across time and space that always is one symbol or another. There is much gray area there, which is important to note. Now, the modern use of this symbol, uh, the hated symbol that will exclusively leave to the realm of what we'll call here a Hockenkreuz, has been used uh, throughout you know, countries all across uh, the world and is used on an unfortunately very frequent basis, far too frequent as we know. Uh, this is just graffiti in uh, Spain. And you'll see again in this particular symbol on the, the third here, obviously, is a Hockenkreuz. And it's, it is tilted a bit to, uh, you know, in terms of that 45 degree piece. Uh, also, the ends are all turning to the right. So whenever I'm referring to uh, the ends turning of the branches, it's that end piece there. Um, and with the Hockenkreuz, uh, especially from an official state function, uh, such as the Nazis, it's always with the ends turning to the right. That is, in fact, a universality that we can look at. Now, if you're, you know, J Joe racist on the street, uh, that does. I don't think you're necessarily always going to take those things into mind, into consideration, and use it consistently. But uh, it is something to to note. So again, we've seen this now used in the UK. That was an example previously in Spain. This was, somebody really had to go out of their way to, uh, in this case, this was a Hakenkreuz recently, so 2020 in Berlin, Germany, that was scrawled on a synagogue's mezuzah, parchment, 
So that, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, is the little scroll inside of a tube, uh, nailed or otherwise placed on the inside of a doorway in uh, Jewish homes, uh, between doorways and on the outside of the main Jewish uh, you know, doorway, as well as on uh, synagogues. I, and so in this case, this individual obviously had to open that up and use a Sharpie and draw on here um, this symbol. Again, now here is uh, a crudely you know, drawn Hockenkreutz with the tilt and with the, the legs uh, turning to the right. Uh, on the red, this was at a memorial to victims of the Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania synagogue shooting, um, but this particular memorial was uh, in Duke University, in the Carolinas. And every one of these examples, um, and so many that we'll look at, you know, speaks to uh, the hate involved, but when they're written about in the media, when they're written about on, you know, whether, whether it's the Associated Press, whether it's, uh, you know, left, right, center, up, down, or whomever is writing about it, they refer to these symbols or you know, these, these hateful Hakenkreuzen as swastikas. So as you'll see here, you know, swastika scrawls on so on and so forth. You know, again, I've highlighted here every time where it was described, and this was a, a BBC, again, swastika. Uh, they blurred this out. Uh, so I had, you know, another image with the image, but in this case, they blurred it out. Uh, in the Berlin in instance, they mention it as a swastika again uh, for the mezuzah. And then lastly, for the Madrid Spain piece, again, swastika. So in, in no cases that I could find, uh, were they talking about this symbol or talking about two separate and distinct symbols as a swastika or a Hockenkreuz. It's now everything that you just saw really uh, ought to be defined as two separate symbols. And there's a number of reasons for that that we'll continue to, to go through. But these were not swastikas. Uh, they were, in fact, what we'll uh, term Hockenkreuzen. Uh, the, these are swastikas, and this is an ancient form of swastika that actually was discovered in the 1700s, uh, presumed to or originate from uh, Norse culture uh, in the 800s, so you know, literally you know, over a thousand years old when this had been discovered even. And it's a little bit hard to see every leg here, but the reality is this was on a stone uh, amongst a, a variety of other runic carvings uh, or etchings. And as you can see it, it is uh, a 45 degree turning uh, symbol, as well as one uh, with all of the legs uh, turning to the right. Uh, this last one is a little bit harder to see. This is called the Snoldelev stone in Denmark in the uh, museum in Copenhagen. There's also a uh, Buddhist swastikas uh, or manji. Uh, and in this case, uh, oftentimes they are left turning. So we're referring to this uh, leg here. Uh, and oftentimes not um, in, you know, at that 45 degree angle. But I say oftentimes because there isn't always a rule here as to 100% of the time what it is. It may predominantly be one way. It may predominantly have an aesthetic uh, look to it, but it is not, uh, you know, always one way or another. So it's very difficult to simply say, ah, just because it's turning or just because they're going to the right or the left, these legs, or just even because of a color scheme, that that's always uh, one or the other. So it makes, uh, and as I'll discuss, uh, controlling for the, uh, the sort of symbol that we consider bad versus good, difficult. This here is a, a Hindu swastika. So it has a, a specific, specific look to it and has some different instances uh, of what this might look like on jewelry, uh, with Ganesh, with, uh, in the flowers, uh, on a, a building or a structure all throughout this region. And so again, in this, in this case, they, the legs happen to be right turning. And in this case, they're all upright. Um, and sometimes they'll have this little uh, additional piece on the end of each of these, but it's difficult to look at a, a universal component. Uh, now the uh, Jains who also uh, revere and honor the swastika as a holy symbol uh, have their own look to it. <clears throat> this is a Jain flag uh, with the swastika prominently and centrally located as a focal point. And here's Jane swastikas all across, uh, to, you know, different areas in stone. Uh, and I guess, you know, over the different hundreds of years on ancient, uh, you know, this is a manuscript cover that has swastikas as well. Uh, and you'll see that, you know, it's this one's a little bit uh, easier to see. And then there's also swastika like uh, symbols and aesthetics on this one to the right. So as I, as I kind of alluded to a little bit earlier, you know, is it, is it as simple? Uh, 
as what uh, you can find online, there's uh, different uh, discussions where they'll say, you know, look, the Buddhist uh, swastika or, you know, some of the other benevolent, uh, you know, religious practicing individuals who look at a swastika, it's always, you know, it's left facing, maybe it's put flat, mainly in gold, yellow, red color. Uh, they'll say that it has a specific look to it and that the Hockenkreuz is the Nazi use symbol with the right facing form and the tilted swastika at an angle of 45 degrees with the corners pointing upwards and invariably in black. Now, while we can say that when you put all of those together exactly like this, I know of no other group uh, using it in that format that would call that a swastika. But is it this simple? Uh, and I'd say not really not exactly. There, there's more to it there. It depends again on the context, the context in which it is found and used. So swastikas that uh, we're terming here, I mean, the Hindu swastika, um, even swastika derivative items, perhaps such as the Slavic uh, Kalavrat, which has within it two overlacing uh, swastikas uh, with right leaning legs in a, you know, that some of them are derivative of sun symbols or eternity symbols, the Armenian eternity symbol. But ultimately, uh, if you look at any number of these here and then compare them on a direct side-by-side -side comparison with Hockenkreuzen, it's still quite difficult for the lay person, for somebody to, to, know, to know without any context what one of these shapes and what one of these symbols is without, uh, again, without that context. And so in the, the, the sense of the context, if you see uh, one of these used in a cemetery, a Jewish cemetery scrawled on something, if it's on synagogue, then I think no one would, would ever really disagree. That's clearly what we, would, we should be terming, what we ought to term, and what the intended hateful racist, what have you, individual is using it for. They're using it uh, for the same purposes that the symbol of the Hockenkreuzen has been used for, and not uh, the loving and auspicious purposes that the, uh, the swastika has actually been used for by millions of people and continues to be used for. So why is it that to a lot of people, they may be hearing this for the first time? Why is it that we, in the in this quote, West, Hockenkreuz coming from, other than obviously being a German word? Well, in the uh, early 1930s, um, Oh, and I got something that popped up that said my internet connection is unstable. Can you guys still hear me? You can start from this page on the top of it because you cut it the first part that you're explaining. Okay, yeah, I, I saw something pop up that said my internet connection was unstable. I just wanted to make sure you can still hear me before I continue. You can hear me now? Yeah, yes. All right, excellent. All right, so continuing here again. In, so in March of 1933, there was a New York Times article that came out and explicitly uh, did not use the words hooked cross. So whether we're saying Hockenkreuz using the original German or hooked cross, similar to how at the time people would be using Mein Kampf, meaning my struggle, Hitler's infamous book. Uh, there was, you know, could you call it my struggle or uh, Mein Kampf interchangeably? Of course, uh, Mein Kampf has uh, been what has been essentially decided upon. But this was the first instance when we see that it was actually referred to as a swastika, as opposed to simply, um, you know, hooked cross, as it was himself referred to, Hitler himself referred to it as a hooked cross, as a Hockenkreuz. So this is somewhat speculative on this nature here, so we can only, you know, look at that a little bit. But there were interests at play that we know of in the USA that may have started to see that you know, calling this image that's more and more associated with pure evil <laughs> over time that saw that this word calling it a cross, even if a hooked cross was simply too close to, to another symbol, the Christian cross, uh, for comfort. Uh, Hitler himself, though, again, as I mentioned, only referred to this as a Hockenkreuz. And Germany, for, for some time before, uh, had been using this symbol as a Hockenkreuz even before it became the prominent Nazi symbol with the colors that we know. Uh, so th there's a few things to the, the Eurocentric uh, view here, that the, meaning the Euro European Western view uh, that looks at this in one particular way and how this paradigm is changing. Uh, for one, the swastika itself as a symbol, uh, not per se the Hockenkreuz, but the swastika is not owned by Holocaust historians. 
previously in the West, uh, you know, there predominantly was you know Jewish and Christian based scholars that have been operating within the Holocaust and genocide studies space. In fact, as a, a space itself, it's been primarily historians and some anthropologists and others, but predominantly again individuals of these uh, backgrounds. Now, throughout the West, we're seeing also some uh, changing trends that immigration from various uh, Asian countries uh, to the West is necessitating a revisit as to how we look at this symbol. Uh, Buddhist, Jain, Hindu individuals that have come from uh, various different countries uh, in quote unquote the East to the West are looking to practice freely and, and of their own religion that they had for, for so many years where there is a symbol used that was uh, nonviolent and loving and everything to them. and clearly distinguished from this other symbol. In fact, um, as TK has mentioned in the past before, in Japanese, there is actually a word which is a cognate, Hakenkreuzu, used for the Hakenkreuz. And uh, of course, the swastika itself is the manji in, in Japanese there. So other cultures do look at them as distinct already. It is here where we, we in the US and in the West, where we have not yet uh, looked at it that way. Going to, to Hitler's own view and the, and the you know, animosity he had uh, in, embedded in this symbol, he believed that the Hakenkreuz also, we shouldn't forget, he, he looked at this symbol as a cross first. Um, if you look at a, a, a number of examples here from the Maltese cross to St. Andrew's cross uh, to the cross Pate and Heldrick cross and St. Patrick's Saltier cross, these are crosses that uh, are, were used in flags, were used as battle flags have been used as symbols of going to war and protecting those who would go to war. So even a non-religious individual, in fact, an individual who might even believe in, uh, you know, replacing uh, Christianity as, a, as itself. And there is a, a whole body of research on, as to Hitler's view there. Nevertheless, looking at it as that heraldic image of protection is something that he, we looked, we know he did. And if you look at other countries within Europe, uh, such as this image here, you can see the similarity of what's here on the left, on the upper left, the Maltese cross and the Order of the Cross of Liberty of Finland, which continued to use this cross and swastika combo where they were, again, very similarly seen, or Hakenkreuz, where they used this symbol together as one symbol of protection and even placed this oftentimes on their uh, planes until uh, that would become problematic and they were no, able, no longer able to. All right. Now, whether we're looking at, again, uh, this uh, symbol, so the flag of the Nazi party, or we're looking at the Balkenkreuz, so the insignia of the Nazi German armed forces, or the division insignia of their panzer divisions, which are using it, you can see even, even the Balkenkreuz to look at for a moment, that symbol is not uh, with that curved endings, but this was and is still used by you know, certain individuals within um, different backgrounds as that same way to get around regulations that might ban uh, a explicitly used uh, Hakenkreuz here and then his personal battle standard. Any of these were derived from heraldic crosses of that same style. Uh, heraldic crosses being crosses that uh, themselves were put on shields for those same protective purposes and this is a, a collection of some that had been used through the centuries and you can even see uh, this one right in the middle that is using what we would you know, possibly call a, a swastika, a Hakenkreuz, what have you. Um, I'd say in this case, because it's not used in you know, this uh, violent, you know, hateful standpoint, it's not a Hakenkreuz per se, but nevertheless, uh, it would be termed that in German. It is a swastika, and it's also very much seen as specifically a cross. So aesthetically, there's no difference to, um, to, to many in Europe during the era. So, you know, what sort of actions can we can we take once we understand a lot of this context and a lot of this, this historical background, which I would imagine is new for some uh, people looking at this. We can use the word itself, Hakenkreuz, start bringing this word back that almost out of a mis mistake, perhaps, or, or not, uh, in, in that article in, in 1933 in the New York Times, regardless of the intent, there, there was a mistake made in the sense that this word was removed or hooked cross was removed from our uh, daily parlance. And so whenever malice is intended, so again, whether that's you know scrawled on a synagogue or a Jewish cemetery or any sort of hateful act, we can distinguish this from a swastika uh, for a variety of reasons, specifically with here protecting those who use the swastika or the manji 
or the wan when discussing the relig religious symbol or symbol of auspiciousness. In the case of any of the, uh, the, the symbols where it's you know on a uh, <clears throat> on a, 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 any sort of religious building of you know Jains, Hindus, and, and uh, <clears throat> Buddhists, we know that this is not clearly a Hawk and Kreitz. And just a, an, another note as to how we talk about this: if you have to translate um, Hawk and Kreitz, and I think there is a benefit to keeping it called a Hawk and Kreitz for that German not, not uh, German and Nazi connection where it was first uh, weaponized. I think if you do have to uh, see an interest in translating it, uh, doing so as hooked cross um, would, be, would be the way to go. Uh, some of the uphill battle that we have uh, with any of these new word adoptions, although this is certainly not impossible, is if you look even at uh, Microsoft Office's spell check when I was putting some of this together in PowerPoint or even writing my thesis, the fact is that Hocking Christ is seen, of course, as a typo with the little red wiggles underneath of it. So you know that uh, you know, when that's changed, that we've, we've made some progress as to, as to how it's even acknowledged as a word, whether or not it's used in one fashion or another. And the government regulations going further though, the, the, the kind of you know, blunt tool that can be used in those cases that uh, ban the use of certain symbols, uh, we will find create actually a forbidden fruit complex, I'll call it where it's no longer something that is, is legal, it's legally accessible. And, and so uh, there's other social tools you can use uh, when something is legal to discourage individuals from using something. I mean, I, I know in a number of different areas, uh, you know, in the US, for example, due to free speech uh, reasons, the Hockenkreuz is not uh, banned or regulated in any way. You could buy a Nazi flag online, you could display it if you wanted, but this certainly wouldn't uh, do well for your business, do well for your neighbors or do well anything there. So it is self-regulated in a lot of ways. In these European countries where that's not the case, uh, Germany being one of them, uh, where they regulate the Hockenkreis and they refer to it only as the Hockenkreis, not the swastika, the fact remains that there's a lot of other symbols that become more appealing um, very easily uh, so you can get around the regulations uh, because it has not simply been <laughs> ignored. So I'll say forbidden fruit becomes more appealing and then ignore fruit. So you have uh, this Italian symbol uh, from, these are all neo-Nazi uh, fascist groups uh, throughout, uh, the, in some cases, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and even current day, present day, where, you know, such as Golden Dawn in Greece, where, um, and this Mon particular Adair uh, Mongol group that used the symbol either uh, directly, but with some different color schemes, um, and then other symbols where they're using the colors to clearly pull it out. And, uh, Anyone in graphic design will tell you that color goes a very long way to imparting uh, a view. So it's not always just about the shape that can lead to potential violent action. So closing this out a little bit, I just have to say that there's, there's no question that we have to uh, maintain that duty to, you know, as it's called, you know, never forget to ensure that this doesn't, of course, apply just to Jews, but applies to, you know, in, in any case, any genocide, any democide anywhere in the world, and that we must, uh, you know, continue to, to do what it, we can to prevent any sort of mass atrocities from occurring. Um, but at the same time, it's also very much worth considering that we do not ignore the rights of others in the process, the rights of, uh, you know, self-expression and speech uh, for a symbol that is uh, you know, not easily dismissed, but is core to one's religious identity and core to how one uh, looks at, at these pieces. Uh, I think it, the U.S. is interesting in the sense that because there's no uh, regulation uh, on how these symbols are, you know, allowed to be used versus uh, Germany, we will we see that there isn't to the same degree this fascination with trying to use a like symbol or even prominently display the symbol itself when it is allowed. So. Uh, from both from the interest of protecting um, and being aware of sensitivity, both Holocaust survivors and, and Jews generally and anybody else affected by this symbol, but also from the perspective of, uh, we have to just keep in mind this, this other component uh, of you know, Hindu relations as well as uh, again, Jewish relations. And we'll see with Jains, Buddhists and, and so many others that, that will have a uh, opinion on this. Uh, some voices in the space will say that, uh, you know, it may be that the, that the swastika itself, or the Hakenkreis rather, as, uh, depending on how you term it, is uh, irredeemable, that it cannot be uh, redeemed in any sense. 
Um, but the reality is that it, it is a matter of time almost, maybe 10, 15, 100 years, whatever it is, it is a matter of time before at some point uh, some of these symbols do come back into the light, uh, uh, or some of these shapes rather, if we're, if we're taking the meaning out of it. It is a matter of time then. So taking ownership for this and taking a proactive stance as to uh, you know, understanding the differences, I think is absolutely key. All right, and with that, I will say th thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff, for wonderful presentation. Uh, appreciate it very much. And uh, also, yeah, uh, congratulations for your, again, uh, MA uh, thesis for this. And uh, I understand you will continue for this particular area for the PhD program in the future. So I'm wishing the good luck to you. And uh, so and so it's very grateful that you quote many part of my book. Uh, my, 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 I, by the way, I forgot to introduce myself. My, my name is uh, Reverend Dr. TK Nakagaki. Uh, I'm the actually author of the the Buddhist swastika and Hitra's cross, rescuing a symbol peace from the uh, forces of hate. So, so that's the uh, book. And uh, um, so, yeah, because uh, the nice part of uh, Jeff covering some of the parts that I didn't cover. Like, uh, actually, I wanted to cover more for the cross, for instance. And uh, so, so I'm very grateful that you're covering. And also the one for the hate group parts, I didn't really cover. <laughs> and uh, so you cover some parts too. And so there are many parts that I, I know I didn't cover. So which is the more point, point it should be, uh, you know, made. And so... So I, well, in a way, I'm very grateful for myself that that, that uh, I wrote this book and then some something came out out of that book. So which is very wonderful. So I thank you for that. Uh, so today, um, so I wanted to first maybe uh, Greta Erbogen. Uh, so she'll be uh, the survivor of a Holocaust, and as I mentioned, she has been was my, uh, you know the the site team members, which is giving me advice and, uh, you know, the, the what should be done for this particular things. And then we have, you know, especially it's very sensitive issues. And then her voice for me was very, very valuable, uh, invaluable, I mean, so really, really important. And so I'm very grateful that she was able to come here today to share uh, her thought or her response. So Greta, uh, if you if you like to say something more for yourself, please do, and then maybe you can uh, you know. It says that know. I'm unmuted. I, I'm not. Can you hear me? Oh yes, you hear me. yes. Oh good. <laughs> well, um, I just want to say good evening, good evening to everybody, to guests, and to you. Reverend T.K. Nakaki and Jeff Kelman and Rabbi Potashnik. I think he's here already, right? Well, I couldn't. I, I don't think so. He, he should be. I see one more time. person. Uh -huh. So, but am I to start? Yes. <laughs> she, she can. So I just want to say thank you for including me to this very important gathering. Uh, as you mentioned, I am a Holocaust survivor and a, called a hidden child. And as a hidden child, talking was not allowed. So even now, till today, I get jitters talking in public and uh, forgive me for that. So my background, I come from a traditional Orthodox Jewish family. And um, what I didn't say earlier that I'm obligated to speak, even though it's so hard for me to go into a presentation because I'm a Holocaust survivor, because I'm the only healthy person that survived in my family. 
I have seen so much suffering that somebody has to stand up and talk for all of them. So I am here for the people who cannot speak. So when I, I was raising four children in Brooklyn, I also was able to get my education and get a master's degree in social work on the college. And as soon as I earned my degree, I went to an agency working with Holocaust survivors and asked them to be employed. Once I began working, I actually started to study again. I just needed to understand more why there is so much suffering in the world. Why being Jewish should be a problem. My great grandfather was a very well known rabbi, a beautiful human being, mm. and I was I was selected to be killed. I never understood really how humanity is on, in such a bad shape. Let's put it this way: that even the Jewish teachings didn't give me all the answers. So I had to go to Hindu centers to really get the philosophy, the depth, what they are teaching. Then I had to go to Buddhist centers. And again, what I found, there was a lot of beauty and similarity to the teachings, Jewish wisdom teaching, Buddhist wisdom teaching. It's just teaching humanity. And what else? It's really connecting you to the higher power. Self-development. What is more important than to understand that we are on this earth to learn to grow and ask questions? But I would say the world right now is on a crossroad and we are hopefully a bigger group, a bigger entity that we are figuring out how to bring young people, the world to a better place. But the Holocaust at some point will be unthinkable. When the symbol of swastika will be something of so many different symbols that the world has. And we got so stuck, especially Jewish people, swastika and anti-Semitism. I constantly been, um, how shall I say, bombarded with fear. Everything that we are dealing with really talks about fear. Our culture, did a lot of interesting things. Some people want to be empowered. The only way they know how to be empowered to disfranchise somebody else. We can change that. We can change that. I think the next generation and the generation after that, when I talk to young people where I work regularly, I get a lot of hope and they really want to hear what I have to say and what I have to say this is now we are on a brink of bringing in something new something clean everything that we're dealing with is like really reevaluating just like he did such a beautiful job with the manji right detail 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 and what does it say at the end, right? It's how you want to embrace it or hate it. It's all up to us at the end. So I said, let me tell you a little bit how I got to know TK, right? 
<laughs> so 2011, I was already a volunteer speaker at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. And I got an assignment to go to this church because I'm going to be with Hiroshima survivors. I think there were two Holocaust survivors, two Hiroshima survivors. And I, I'm always up to the challenge. I said, what could be more exciting to talk to other people who went through cruelty, right? Suffering. And I think it was a very pleasant, very surprisingly pleasant mm -hmm. and warm afternoon, correct? Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> so a little while later, TK gave me a phone call and asked me the following. Dear Greta, I'm doing my doctorate in right, uh, and interfaith, would you be interested to be my um, advisor, right? Right. Would you, <laughs> <laughs> advisor of what? So first I taught Jewish studies, Holocaust material. I didn't yet know what the topic is of his dissertation. <laughs> So we meet the first time, I never forget the meeting, he puts down a small description of his dissertation topic. And all of a sudden I couldn't believe it, is about swastika. That's the only word I knew then in 2011. And I only knew very little of it, only what in New York, mm -hmm. the, the languages about hate when Jewish institutions are, are you, you know, getting the symbols and there is a lot of worry about the meaning of those symbols. Mm -hmm. So I said, TK, I tell you the truth. I don't know much about swastika. I didn't know it's a stolen name. I want to know more. He also told me, he said, I tell you the truth, most people discourage me to do it because people are not comfortable to even bring up the word swastika. And I said, now we really have to do it because I believe like a TK, we have to bring up, it's just no, proper communication, no proper information. And I said, my goodness, I didn't know that my Hindu friends have swastika for the holidays. They even cook a dish. I don't know what she was explaining to me for the big holiday once a year, because it's a very beautiful symbol. It made me very happy. So again, we're talking about stealing, <laughs> right? And, and even that the American journalism in the beginning didn't pay attention that they're not using the right words. So it's worth to bring us up. It's very important. But for me, it's more to help my Jewish community because I know my friends Holocaust survivors, family members, they still so stuck with staying with the meaning of the swastika. We have to work for the next generation to let go. As you know, Jewish history is persecution. We have a good time and then hundreds of years off and on, Jewish people were persecuted. So I don't blame some of the people who still have this very worried, very limited way of sitting in fear. I give you another example. I was with a taxi with another lovely Hungarian survivor, a taxi. I talk to every driver. I make a friend 
in the car. They mostly Pakistani, Hindu, uh, Hispanic, few black. I'm sitting with her and I start to talk to the driver. And she pulls me with such toughness and she whispers to me, you don't talk to the driver. And to me, that hurts that we are so stuck in this, be careful, a Jewish girl does not make a friend with a Pakistani, with a Muslim. How can we bring in a better world with that kind of thinking? So I am ready to give up persecution. I love to dance. I love to sing. <laughs> I love to have fun. And I want to do everything possible in my power to continue this message. And I already have some grandchildren, thank God, I'm very blessed, who really understand me, even though they're ultra orthodox. And some of them say, yeah, this Bobby is different. She is very deep. I want to hear what she has to say. And that's what we're going for. Now, <clears throat> I would like to say this as an ending, and then I hope to be able to read a poem. Mm. I would say to us, to everybody, let's untangle the manifestations of the culture of hate, the culture of divisions. Let's untangle all that. There is so much more than swastika. This is one part that we need to work with. And let's do it with patience and love. That's the only way, and we're doing it. So I thought <laughs> for extreme, I like to know that I'm a little bit extreme in my thinking. I'm a little bit moving fast. I'm thinking already the second generation after me because I believe that the children of today and the next generation, their DNA will be healthier. We leave behind some of this war mentality, enemy mentality, and try to enjoy life. So much easier that way, mm -hmm. at least for me. So how many minutes do I have? <laughs> whatever three minutes so if you like I like to tell stories this poem I wrote is called Dialogue with a Water Bug and the reason I wrote this poem because some years ago I had a lovely friend here sitting in my house we were eating dinner after being on the beach gorgeous day, Labor Day weekend, and I have a guitar, I love to sing, he loves to play, so we're in the middle of eating this lovely food, music, the sun was still up, and all of a sudden a water bug shows up in this beautiful idyllic day, and my friend noticed that, and he says, look, 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 there is a bug. What are you going to do? And I looked and I did nothing. I didn't want to do anything. I couldn't. And he says, I'm so happy I'm not sleeping here. So it took me to a very interesting place because the water bug to me looked beautiful. It was like God's creation came to say hello. And sure enough, he walked slowly under my violin. I happened to have a violin. So for six months, I saw the water bug off and on, flying between my two balls. And then it disappeared. I never found the body. Here is the poem. Dialogue with the water bug. And said the water bug to me pleading, 
please just look at me once without such hate or passion. Who is bigger after all? When a human go astray, you expect to get direction to your destination. And he continued pleading. Please, would you just lead me back to my home? It is simple courtesy. After all, we both, humans and insects, are guests in God's house. I responded, yes, tiny, shiny, black, creature. You may rest in my space for as long as you need to. And the pleading water bug and I became unlikely roommates after all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, uh, and so the water bug is thanking you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> and also, yeah, because of the He's looking down. He's looking down on us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much. And then, uh, yeah, because uh, she's a poet, so she knows how important the words are. I think it's a very, very crucial part. Exactly. But also, I just wanted to share also just a one more point, point because since that's the... Go ahead. I, I used the one poem for me, for me. So that's why I'm going to read this one. Because one thing that I, I use in my book is uh, in her uh, poem called Not In My Dictionary. And somehow I like this one. So I'm, let me read it for you in this case. <laughs> okay. In my dictionary, the word disgusting is replaced with the unique nature of things. The word hate is replaced with inquiry into the fam unfamiliar. Instead of revenge, is stated dialogue with one who hurt me. In place of the words war is written, building bridges of understanding between myself and others. So thank you so much. <laughs> okay, now, uh, yeah, let me also introduce the uh, Rabbi Patasnik. So he's with us now. I know he has been very, very busy. So maybe if you don't mind, introduce. Uh, uh, he's, of course, executive um, uh, vice chair, uh, vice president of the New York, uh, New York, uh, what <laughs> board of rabbis? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> and so so I'm very glad uh, he was able to join us, even sort of part of the limited time with us. So thank you, TK. Thank you so much, and I'm sorry I can't stay because these are difficult times, and we have all these Zoom calls and thinking, how are we going to lower the tensions in some meaningful way? Uh, let me say to you, I've come to learn, TK, and knowing you and your colleagues, some of whom I know. Uh, on this call, that we live in a world where we travel in separate lanes without traveling uh, together. And I, and I think what we, you talked about building bridges, we need to bring, build a bridge where we can travel, uh, you know, with one another. But also, it doesn't mean that we have to agree on all, uh, on all issues. Do you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There were some problems with the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, what I was saying was that listening to your words, TK, and I've come to know and respect you and the others. 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 <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. I, I, in, in meeting many of your colleagues and discussing the issue, uh, I've come to the realization that we do have different narratives. Uh, we have different narratives about the Middle East. We have different narratives about Hockenkreutz swastika. We have different narratives when it comes to the founding of America. I don't think there's any issue today where we have unanimity of opinion. But I think what we're, we can do, and it would be a constructive movement, is educating people that there are different narratives. Because I think if you talk about swastika, there's only one narrative. And that people know that since the 1920s, when the Nazis co-opted the symbol, there's been a narrative of hatred surrounding the symbol. And I think what we must do, especially with young people, especially in the classroom, is enlighten them 
that when you look at a symbol, you have to understand context. You have to understand historical background. Otherwise, you're going to walk away and only know one narrative when there are two. Uh, so that's where I think we need to work together. Uh, you know, I once said that in New York, we should have a museum of tolerance. We, uh, we had it years ago, but unfortunately, it was too costly to maintain for that organization. But can you imagine if people were able to go, to, young people in particular, were able to go to someplace and learn the respective histories of different peoples and know, for example, the, the sufferings of different people, know the celebrations of different people, we would be in a much better place. So I'm hoping we could work uh, in collaboration to develop that curriculum that really stresses different narratives for different peoples so they don't just walk away with a slanted interpretation uh, of a symbol or a story. Thank you so much for joining and uh, yeah, again. And uh, so, okay, uh, now let me, I know the time is running too. So I just wanted to uh, have, if you have any question to the, the Jeff at this point, uh, uh, please have, uh, you know, raise your hand if you have, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think you may have missed this part, uh, Rabbi Potasnik, but uh, I just, you know, quickly mm -hmm. sharing my screen. That was pretty much what I led off with in my presentation was that context was, was absolutely paramount. So I didn't, I didn't misinterpret what you said. I, I think you were very much in line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I think we, one of the things I've learned because of our interfaith relations that we who are not Hindus, we who are not Buddhists, we have a special obligation to tell the entire story. You know, because for too long, a group that was aggrieved would only talk about, you know, its pain. But now, based upon relations that we have with one another, I think we can do much to help one another. Uh, and that to me is, when it says love your neighbor on many church doors and synagogue doors and mosque doors, it doesn't say love your Jewish neighbor or your Christian neighbor. It says love your neighbor uh, because neighbor applies to many groups of many backgrounds and beliefs. So I think that's our, as we say, a mitzvah. That's the commandment that we need to honor and fulfill. Great. Great. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, the, sorry. Uh, Razi? Yes. I'm so glad that I get to hear, you know, all the three speakers, Jeff, Greta, and now Rabbi Putasnik, you know, it's always very encouraging that, you know, you're looking at different points of view to have better understanding. So I think uh, today's Jeff presentation was something that I have not listened before. So I'm encouraged that TK is bringing all different points of view together. And uh, I was so, so impressed with talking with uh, Rabbi Potasnik in the, our New York Interfaith Center. So I'm glad that he's here today. I know he's very busy with what's happening in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Again, thank you for, you know, DK to let me know ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. you so much for your uh, all kindness and support for the, this, you know, particular thing. So thank you. And uh, so maybe this might be a great timing because in a way, the, the, one of the reasons that we're doing this is also right now we're doing a crowdfunding for the film called Manji. Uh, that's the kind of Japanese term, but the means swastika in, uh, but then the, of course, the kind of positive Buddhist swastika type of things. But so, uh, so today we have uh, uh, direct, uh, first of all, producer Adam Weissman and together with the uh, director and uh, camera, uh, Yosuke Kiname. So I would like to introduce to you for both. <laughs> so, I, uh, so anyway, and then the, also today, Jeff is uh, 30s too. So is it like a, so many 30s people uh, on the, uh, the panel? So which means we're talking about young generation also, but then not just the young generation only, but we do have all the mature 
the you know the experienced people who can share their experience like i mean i, I shouldn't say i mean greta always young but then it's just <laughs> it is, but then uh, you know patasnik is all you know the experienced anyway so skillful and everything so so it would be always nice to have all the combination of uh, you know working together like that so uh can i give you the parts and then if you like to show the films and so forth i leave up to you Absolutely. Thanks, TK. Um, so I'll keep this pretty quick. I, I know some of you have, have met us already. Greta, it's lovely to see you again. I think it's been a year and a half since I saw your face pre-pandemic. Jeff, it's good to see you again as well. Um, thank you, Rabbi Potasnik, for, for speaking. Now, Yosuke uh, and I, we, we've co-produced a movie uh, called Manji that we've been creating with TK's help since early 2019. To make a very long story short, uh, at the end of 2018, Yosuke and I learned about TK's book and were quickly put in touch with him and realized that he was telling a narrative that had not really been told enough in mainstream America, namely uh, the swastika, the history behind it, and then the misappropriation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the Hockenkreutz, as we've been talking about this evening. What Yosuke and I set out to do was create a film that doesn't just capture one side of the story, but does its best job to capture both sides, um, to, to provide that context, uh, both on the Hindu, the Buddhist, the Jainist side, and on the side of the West, you know, the side that so many Americans going back to the 30s and 40s associate with the Nazis. Um, with TK's help throughout, as he's our primary subject, and also put us in touch with so many of the people uh, that we met with and worked with on the film. We've interviewed dozens of people across Japan uh, and New York, including a number of rabbis, a number of people of the Hindu faith, a number of people, Buddhist priests and monks. Uh, we've gone to temples. We've met with uh, Japanese government officials. We've met with the owner of a, a ramen shop whose logo is a gigantic swastika. You know, TK had a really good day there <laughs> getting some free samples. Um, and through it all, we have encountered a lot of obstacles. I can say without question that getting funding to, for this film is difficult. We're fortunate enough that we can have events like this where we are really in some sense preaching to the choir. We're speaking with people who, whose minds are already open to these issues. And while they might be learning when they're attending these events, it's very clear that we're all coming to these events to learn. Um, we've had a lot of obstacles. We've had a lot of pushback. Uh, just, just being able to make the film and get the money we needed to make the film has been very difficult. But we're very proud to say that after about two years of filming, Yosuke and I wrapped filming uh, earlier this year. We have captured all the footage we'll need and we're ready to finish the film. And what we have done in the last two and a half weeks was run, start a crowdfunding campaign for this film. We'll put the link up to the crowdfunding campaign at the end. And I'm very proud to say that as of tonight, we are at about 80% of our entire goal. So we are very close to the end. Um, while everybody's help is absolutely welcome and still needed, I, it looks like we're going to have this film ready to be released to the world sometime this year. Our plan is create this thing, try to get it out to some film festivals, try to get a little bit, bit of buzz around it. And ultimately, once it's out there, use it as a tool for education. You know, we want to get out there. We want to provide something that is digestible, something that any person off the street can watch and learn and hopefully open their mind and open their heart to a context or a perspective that they might not have considered. So with all that being said, we've prepared tonight a short sort of reel, about two minutes of some of the clips from our film. I'm going to turn it to Yosuke, who might say a word or two and then share that from his screen. Cool. Yeah, I think my obviously um, Adam has phrased it all very well. Um, so this short tra teaser, uh, teaser trailer is about two minutes. Um, it's it highlights uh, a lot of the people that we've uh, interviewed, and uh, I think you'll find it very interesting. So let me share the screen. <laughs> oh. 
Are you okay? I hope. <laughs> uh, so also, yeah. For sorry, I I thought you cannot make it today, so that's why I put <laughs> didn't put your face on the flyer. <laughs> so but I just wanted to apologize <laughs> publicly. No, no, no. Yeah, oh, but, uh, uh, I am having some issues sharing. Oh, maybe I can. Oh, yeah. oh okay. Now it's ready, I guess. Let me know if there's any issues. Once you say swastika is good, this person is evil. So I'm very evil now. <laughs> but in India, it is seen all over, outside, inside, every place you see it. But here, we certainly avoid it, placing it outside. But I think each individual probably has to ask themselves based on their history, do I need to negotiate the symbol or do I need to just let it be? On one side, it's really violent and on another side, it's peaceful. And there it is. There are people who today are being murdered by people inspired by what that means, by what that swastika signifies to them. As long as they're survivors and even children of survivors, um, the visceral reaction to the swastika is very, very strong. When the people say swastika is evil symbol, I feel very sad too. Why do you have to tr treat the good symbol as that way? I can understand that it's a misappropriation of another tradition's symbol, but it's used for nefarious purposes. But to try and convince people who still are bearing the scars of that use of swastika, because whether Hitler called it that or not, if the last thing the person you love most in the world experienced was a person wearing that symbol, blowing their brains out, what they called it, doesn't matter it doesn't matter to them it doesn't matter and that no there's no maybe that's the problem and then you can see that 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 you can see どういうふうに相手を理解するかお互いを理解していくかっていうのがすごく大切になってくると思うんでだからそのシンボルをねよみがえらすことっていうのはある意味で人類の歴史をちゃんとよみがえさせてもらうことにもなるしヘイトクライムもどうやってできてるかもよくわかると思うんですよ。Sound was actually not really good. I mean, the, the oh. so somehow the one that I had, yeah, sent me was much much clearer. Everything so, but but then the the actual one is a really more. I mean, the sound is very clear. The screen is very sharp. Everything the image is very sharp. Everything. So I just wanted to. I think I think we saw. I think we suffered a little from airing it on Zoom. But if anyone's interested in watching more of those clips, highly recommend you go to our site, and I'll just type that into the chat on the side, which is seedandspark.com slash fund slash Munji. And, oh, spelled that wrong over there. What, what we've kept up there is a foot, some footage of a quick two minute video filmed by Yosuke and myself, just talking about the crowdfunding campaign generally. But if you go there as well, there's also a link to about five minutes of more raw unedited footage. So. I recommend you check it out. Um, by all means, we are always looking for more people to follow and get exposure to the film and to the themes in the film. So if you go to that website, just click the little follow button and it, it goes a long way to help getting this film and this project and this story out to more people. <coughs> Yosuke, do you want to say something more? Uh, no, no, I, I think, uh, I think that, was, that was great. Um, we also... We'll have another um, event uh, next week on the 25th. Um, if you follow us on Instagram and other, uh, Facebook, uh, we'll be posting um, more about that. Uh, we'll have uh, several interfaith leaders uh, talking and discussing about the complexity of the swastika and all of that. So uh, if you're interested, please follow us. And uh, yeah, we'll keep you guys posted. OK. So great. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I don't know if you, maybe I just, because for the Facebook Live, I have to show something, otherwise people may not be able to see what's the things. Uh, but anyway, for the part of the 
the visit the site is uh yeah the seed s e e d and a n d uh, spark s p a r k dot com slash f u n d fund slash manji m a n j i so that's the part and uh, I wonder whether I can share somehow <laughs> so. Anyhow, um, so thank you again. And then one thing is that uh, was uh, also very for me. It's nice to have, you know, kind of kind of because my book itself, I go to also uh, I don't know the Japan and then the like um, Poland and Holocaust place. So so in a way, Jewish person and then the Japanese person are working together for the film. That itself is like uh, representing my book, <laughs> basically. So, so it's a kind of a nice way to see both of you are working together. And um, so, so I it's a, even for that sense, that's like a, also like an east and west together type of things for me. <laughs> so it's the uh, kind of uh, very uh, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, representing what we are doing it. And I'm sure they will have a lot of dialogue as you make the pro, you know, this film too. So that's something that I wanted to see. So, so I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the, you know, final products uh, very soon and uh, everything. So, uh, and uh, so I just wanted to congratulate your, you know, great efforts to make this uh, film possible. And uh, I'm sure that there's a lot of people will benefit from. Uh, uh, your film, and I'm very uh, proud to be part of it. So, thank you. Thank you, TK. Okay, so uh, last week we do have uh, maybe free chat. <laughs> maybe, you know, each whoever wanted to speak of uh, uh, things at this point, you're welcome to do, I think. Uh, yeah, so. Um, mm, mm, mm. I think, you know, it's a very good thing that you brought young people in, especially, like you said, you know, uh, Yosuke and Adam are working together, you know, that means a lot, you know. And I want to introduce, you know, Sanjeev Goyal, who is not showing his face now. He's in about same congregation, you know. He's the Arya Samaj in New Jersey. Okay. Okay. He's the president of Arya Samaj in New Jersey. And uh, so maybe if he can turn on the video, you know, you will see him. <laughs> TK has helped me out, you know, in the Interfaith Center of New York in this discussion about Swastika Bill in New York State, which is also coming to New Jersey. So mm -hmm. I'm going to need all your help. You know, Jeff presentation was very impressive. You know, something new that I haven't heard all the things before. No doubt I've listened to TK quite a few times. And uh, I know Greta had this good heart of dealing with everybody, you know, that I appreciate that. So it's a very good feeling, you know, you have a positive feeling mm -hmm. rather than all discussing negative things, you know. I mean, <laughs> negative things are created <laughs> by people, you know. Uh, so, but we are trying to create a positive thing by having understanding between many faith groups and uh, it's educational, especially for school children. Because, you know, sixth grade children are going to be learning about this, you know. Many of the people don't learn the right thing. So I think if you make this uh, movie especially, uh, you know, it will be very helpful for education. I really want to support, you know, what you are doing the Manji film. Again, thank you, yeah, Tiki, thank for you. letting me know mm -hmm. it's time. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, do you want to say anything from the Hindu point of view? Uh, you know, Hindu point of view is that you know, swastika is consi considered to be auspicious, you know. We consider swastika in every auspicious occasion. People have swastika in the house. They have swastika in the, you know, wedding uh, invitations, you know, in the temples, you know. Everywhere in India, if you go, almost every temple have swastika, like, you know, swastika in Buddhist temple in Japan and Hindu temples in India. Mm -hmm. swastika. You know, it has been a symbol there for thousands of years, you know, same thing with Jain temples also. So we always consider swastika as a very auspicious symbol, you know that? Mm -hmm. So its meaning is, you know, auspiciousness, you know, bringing good luck, 
like you in a Japanese, they say for bringing peace, symbol of sun, you said. So very, these are all interrelated as a very good auspicious symbol in us. Uh, but with the, you know, un misunderstanding created by, you know, uh, hook cross and mixing with swastika, we have to try to straighten out to get more education. So children who are growing up, especially, you know, younger generation, they're young children, when they see swastika at home, and then in school, they say this is the hate symbol. It's a very difficult thing to accept. So we want to educate them, you know, how people misuse the name swastika, you know, made into a hate symbol rather than an auspicious or peace symbol. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that TK and, you know, Adam and Yusuki uh, try to, you know, help also with Jeff, you know, to make people understand educationally, which is the most important thing. Education is the only thing that's going to take away all the prejudice and misunderstanding and hate. I'm very grateful for that. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Jeff, you wanted to say anything? Uh, 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 sure. Before, yeah. before, before okay. I, maybe I should just make a little comment. So, so you know, the, I, of course, I read your, you know, things. So, uh, and then, the, uh, no, I, I totally agree about the, some of the statement that I made for the Japanese, how the left turn, right turn will be seen. But that, that's, that's actually the, like a standard now is really, if you're in Japan, I mean, you don't know the other symbol much. So it was actually interesting for Japanese people to realize, I thought, you know, we all thought that was a only Buddhist symbol, not, not really considered the Hindu, Jains, and Native Americans, uh, only Japanese. So that's why we just feel like, oh, difference between, for, for Japanese people in general, difference between swastika and the Hitler's Hakenkreuz is only the directions change, you know, the, because most of the time the Japanese one is a left turn of the swastika but then the right turn i mean the he throws the right turn so that that was the one thing that they feel that's the that's the right understanding but it's actually not really true so because the buddhist text and so that's why my my let what, what do you call it? the writing goes to the next one so based upon the buddhist sutra or the other you know the buddhism then it changes especially why the japanese or other buddhists now use the left turn is because the, the swastika become the character, one of the Chinese character. So Chinese character become the left turn, left turn become a standard Chinese character of manji. Mami is 10,000 anyway. So, so that's why it's, uh, so it, after that, all the manji become like a, more like a to Buddhism become left turn. But then the originally the, like a Buddhist text and then they all right turn. So right turn is more like cor correct or actually you know, standard. And uh, lot, the way I understand sometimes Hindu people here is the left turn is also like a light of the moon, maybe. But so in, from that sense, maybe <laughs> kind of appropriate for the Buddhism because we do have a lot of moon, you know, full moon day, like a Vesak, this is a Vesak month. So it's a full moon day. So maybe if the left turn is a moon represent, they might be appropriate. But then also, of course, the right turn as the, like a sunlight. So both lights are very important. So both are kind of related to the sun, you know, in a nighttime or daytime. And so, so, pro so either case, it's, is uh, you know, the auspicious symbol for us. But so it's a, a lot of, for me also, a lot of learning because <laughs> uh, if the Greta said uh, before, you know, that, that was uh, uh, first time you ever thought about this. But then for me also, I never really thought about it, you know, detail for deep or the, you know, or like a sutra. I never check whether this swastika was taught by the Buddha. And so, so I start learning more things. So it's actually, for me, it's also a great learning experience. And then one of the things is uh, also when we were talking with Greta before, you know, she suggests me to think of the cross also, you know, when she grew up, the cross is something the parents say, oh, that's the, you know, the hey symbol, really. It's not the swastika used to be because there's no swastika before that much of that impact. But then the cross was uh, one of the hey symbol before. And so, so that's why she suggests me to watch some of the movies and so forth. And so, so that kind of relation between the cross and then the hooked cross, or Hakenkreuz, is uh, very, very tight. And so, so the Jeff clearly, you know, uh, revealed 
his study, so which was uh, for me wonderful. And so it's kind of all connected today. <laughs> yes, Brett. I want to say something. Mm -hmm. You yeah. hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, great. <clears throat> Let me think if I remember what I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> first of all, Jeff, you did a fantastic job. Thank you. Definitely ready for schools because it gets exciting, you know, colors, shapes, history. How bad is it? <clears throat> right? Mm -hmm. But I wanted to say something about the cross, yes. So I don't know if um, people realize that in Europe, at least in Hungary, there were a lot of churches where uh, a statue of Christ would be front of the building or on a cross hanging naked, the typical picture of Christ, right? On cross. The crucifix. Yeah. Crucifix. I don't know. I, I don't talk about it, so I'm not familiar with the lingo. Yes, crucifix. I don't. So what happened again, even in that scene, how I was told to look away, right? Because I want to tell you why I bring it up. So of course we knew that the Christian teachings slowly became anti-Semitic. And of course we know a lot about what Paul did or didn't do and so on. But it's more important for you, you guys to hear the good side. I want to bring in the good story. Mm -hmm. So, all right, as a child, I was to look away. I'm not supposed to look at it. Today, I understand the history of Jesus, and I see it from a totally different place. But what's more important, that just like the swastika teaching, what I'm going to tell you, it's very hard for us to disseminate. And even if we know about a big positive change in any of the segment of what we're talking about, very hard to make the change, right? For people to really say, I got it. So in the 70s, there was a sister Rose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Darren Rose. And I don't even know how I found out about it. Tara Rose was a wonderful uh, sister who was studying maybe for her dissertation. Serious student and went to the superior. And I said to them, you know, I don't understand. What do you want from the Jewish people? The text that I'm reading is full of the Jewish being blamed. And all the things that they blame the Jews for troubles. In the Bible, I don't see this. This is Star and Rose, this famous nun, made a noise. The superior said, if you can write up a very detailed research where you have the text, you can go to the Vatican. And she did. I think it was in the 70s. I didn't today look at the exact date. But you have to remember how we have to try harder because this information is not known yet. And it has been so many years that the Vatican wrote a new statement, Nostre Atate, it's called. And it's about removing hateful language regarding the Jewish people. And it's a serious document. And if you ask any Catholic in New York, you didn't hear about it. So why I'm bringing this up, this is always just the beginning, right? It's so hard to make people really get the right information and, and to make a difference. Even the Catholics, even Terry Rose has a whole organization in New Jersey. 
and most people don't know about it. They do dinner once a year. They teach uh, Holocaust studies, I think, at the center. And Sister Rose went to Israel, I was told, 50 times. And people were uh, telling about him, I have a feeling Sister Rose is a Jew. <laughs> because he was too much a spokesperson for persecution of Jewish people through the church itself. So I want to bring it in as a good thing. So if you didn't know about it, even on the side, Jeff, is this interesting for you? Oh, sure, sure, absolutely. And I think that so much of these things, though, I mean, stem back to something you said earlier, which is that, um, you know, there's an embedded fear and an understandable fear as to, you know, why people would be afraid or have this legacy of fear. But nevertheless, um, fear itself, while there might be an illusion of safety or uh, protection, the reality is that doesn't prevent another Holocaust. But education, love, um, and other components there may. And so that's an important part within all of this. It's not may. I am telling you it will. Because the young, as I said, have a whole different makeup. God is helping us in this direction. So, because with our background, with our instincts, negative response, very hard to bring change. Like I said, Sister Rose did an amazing job. Where is the response, right? You didn't hear a big article and big conversations. We have to really let the world know that we took out anti-Semitic texts from the Christian New Testament. You never heard a big noise. So, but I believe that the younger people have a whole different take, beginning even. And maybe because Jeff introduced the manji in elementary school already, because it could be fun. They can draw, they can do it. It's color. It's interesting, like any history. What's so bad about the symbol of dinner, a symbol of New Year, right? Who doesn't love holidays? Tiki, can, can my wife it. make a little comment? Oh, she oh, listened to sure. you. Oh, okay. Oh, she sorry. The sorry. Parliament of all religion. You yeah. were talking about swastika, TK. So oh. she will your talk. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, after, after uh, Gret, do you finish? I mean, sorry, sorry. Just no, it's okay. If conclude, your, conclude, your, conclude your sentence, then the, we we'll... I forgot what I wanted to say. <laughs> All I, anyway, I, we really I appreciate was you. Yeah. a chat, right? Uh -huh. That we still have to do what we're doing because you never know mm -hmm. which the silliest things sometimes can make a big difference. A little incident can yeah. change the world. You never know. In the Bible, do you know they say that the temple was destroyed because a nail fell out of a carriage wheel and something didn't get there on time. In other words, the, the higher powers right create sometimes little incidences that can change the world mm -hmm. so the manji project could be the thing yeah. who knows this terrors couldn't do it yeah yeah right, okay. right? yeah so that's <laughs> yeah. what i wanted to yeah. say okay. but it's good to bring it up because now you mm -hmm. can look into it you can talk to a christian friend right. did you know there was an austria tate mm -hmm. yeah thank you okay. so much so, uh, so sorry, the uh, Jyoti, uh, how you pronounce your name? Sorry, Jyoti. Jyoti. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for joining today. It's really very, very insightful. Thank you, Jeff, Adam, Yusuke, and of course, TK. I had the opportunity to listen to you at the Parliament of the World's Religion, and Father mm -hmm. Phil, who's an Italian uh, Catholic priest, he and I went to a session, and uh -huh. we had. You were the one who, who brought it up, and then the Hindu, uh, you know, leadership, the Muni and Sadri spoke on the Hindu point of view. 
Mm. Uh, but growing up in India, you know, the oldest, one of the oldest Jewish colonies in South India, and I don't know how many of you know, when the second temple was burned, mm. the Jewish people went to India and set up uh, a beautiful synagogue there in Kochi in Southern India. I couldn't go there because of the traffic jam in that area, but uh, we did go to the one in Bombay. So some of the oldest Jewish, uh, you know. Uh, I know a little bit about uh, Jewish people in India, but now they're going a lot to Israel. They've gone back, most of them, but they're still, there's one synagogue in Delhi. I heard. Uh, but something that you may not know, the, the General Jacob, uh, who led the Bangladesh, uh, liberation of Bangladesh in 1971, mm -hmm. was the commander of the Eastern Division of the Army. And he's, he said, I'm, you know, he's Baghdadi Jew. So he says, I'm an Indian first and Jew second. But the Jewish people and Indians and Hindus have lived together because neither one of them proselytized. So they live together in harmony that's what I know. I know about it. And I am very proud. And I'm going to say, no wonder I love Hindu people. <laughs> in, uh, no wonder I always had Hindu friends. Well, the thing is, when I first came to this country as a graduate student, I didn't know one from the other. But most of my friends, I happened to find out later they were Jewish. But there was some connection. I don't know what it was. But in any case, what I was trying to say is, the swastik word is the ch girls' names in India. You know, somebody was saying, oh, we shouldn't talk about the swastik. You know, people in our generation, right? they don't, Indians don't want to rock the boat. They say, let's not do anything. These are doctors and physicians and, you know, engineers and all. They're so afraid to even bring up the word swastik. And I know- I Invite me, I talk to them. <laughs> Because I am tired of the word afraid. I don't want to hurt the Jewish people. I'm tired of the world to be afraid. I'm surrounded by Jewish people. I, I have to close my ear. <laughs> well, but the main thing is in the Swasti word is in the Vedas, the ancient, the most ancient books of knowledge of Hindus. There is a whole chapter called Swasti Vachanam. Swasti mm. means auspicious Vachanam means to speak. So we have mantras that are not swasti, indro, swasti, swasti. So the whole thing is swasti. Mm -hmm. so it's I just, I just want to share with you mm -hmm. that I started to study in a Hindu center, uh, Himalayan Institute. Do you know the name? Yeah, that's right. In Honesdale in, in uh, Pennsylvania. Exactly. So I studied with Swami Rama. Oh, yes, yes. I, I read his book. I mix Buddhist, Hindu, and Jewish mystics. And he was wonderful. So what I wanted to say, I keep forgetting what I want to say. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so, um, nice to forget sometimes. Too. <laughs> no, yes. What I told you, TK, they never talked about swastika. All the years I was involved with the Hindu center. They won't. They won't. No, we don't <laughs> they won't. Want. Yeah, even Buddhists don't, don't want to talk about the swastika. Do either. you know how many books I bought from him? How many studies? And then I studied with the famous Vietnamese monk Thich Nhat Hanh, Thich Nhat Hanh yep. world famous mm -hmm. master. Not one book, not one place. And I have maybe 25 of his books. Ever, not one lecture. I traveled to his settlement in France. France, yeah. Yes. Uh, and then in New York, they set up the Blue Cliff Monastery. I was everywhere he went. Mm -hmm. I was like a tail. Wherever Thich Nhat Hanh goes, I go. So, not one of his writing. And I said, TK, why? Why couldn't they mention it a little bit? Like you said, they cut it out, it seems. Like well, they tried so, not to do it. No, well, they don't want to hurt the pe right. people. Yeah. That's also, you That's know. That's very kind, but it's time to bring the facts. You no, know, the only other thing is I had to educate the local police department. You know, when I used to get wedding invitations from India, 
they were yeah. assaulted. So uh, I had to educate the police department to, to tell all the people that mm -hmm. if you see a swastik in Hindu home, please don't arrest them. <laughs> yes. I tell you my mentality, you'll be surprised mm -hmm. because I raised myself. I saw only fear and suffering. And I turned that upside down. You see, I'm not going to go there. You can tell me from here till eternity. I only believe in good food, fresh air, and, and loving and creating and working. Right? And again, I forget what I want to tell uh, you. Okay. So maybe <laughs> time is running, so I'm going to conclude. Right. But uh, so maybe but even my, if, 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 yeah, but then the good to have but a conversation. That, <laughs> I just want to say, TK, in ending, okay, go ahead. that even those very special people did not mention in the outside of the country, Swastika, which I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I yeah, didn't that, realize until we had this conversation again. Right, because I was also being quiet 25 years also <laughs> <laughs> before I started this project. That's right. No, no, TK has brought it out. You know, thank you, TK. Uh -huh. And uh, Greta has an open mind. That's great. And Jeff yeah. is educating us new things. But, but I think yeah. you can always put something in there. It's open. Yeah. But now I feel like I'm grateful for the, you know, the speaker, the hate crime speaker. He said yeah. the swastika is a universal symbol of evil. If he didn't say it, I don't react to it. If he knew, you know, if he explained that swastika is a, you know, hate symbol in, in a West or something, then I didn't say anything, raise your hands or anything like that. But then because of the words universal symbol of evil, that sort of like you know, wake me up or maybe this, we have to do something about it. So otherwise, you know, maybe even myself, I try to, you know, why do you have to hurt other people by using the symbol, especially in the West? So, you know, when we started like 25 years ago, nobody knows about the Buddhism itself too. I mean, I, they said, are you Buddhist? Or I mean, they say, are you Baptist? You know, instead of Buddhist. So, you know, <laughs> like that. So there's no no way they know even talk about swastika, you know, there's no use. But then the later on, maybe people learn. But then the 25 years later, still people didn't learn anything. So, I mean, getting worse. So that's why I decided to do it because, uh, you know, there's a the, that was at the Interface Center gathering. So without in a way, the you know waking up the statement of a universal evil, you know I never probably even started to do the the research for this, and even <laughs> from that sense, yeah, even I didn't ask you to <laughs> be a part of the site team or anything like that either. So you know it, it's uh, interesting. I mean, just as you said, one little things can change everything. <laughs> so, yeah, and then again, thank you, Jeff, and then the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, Patasnik has to go, but then the Labai Patasnik, uh, you know, uh, I know he's very, very busy. So, but he's, you know, try to come and then sh share his opinion itself is very wonderful. And uh, of course, and then the um, uh, Adam and uh, yeah, <laughs> Yosuke, thank you for being. And then Greta, without, uh, yeah, just really appreciate so much. And uh, yeah, Raji yeah. and Jati and everybody else to share some of the thoughts. And then, and then again, I'm sorry that uh, somehow I think I, I turned down a lot of people in a way that uh, the the post that I did was a little wrong information. I mean, they just only st stuck to the uh, one part of the flyer, it's okay. But if they follow the contents that I write, they, they may have a problem. So anyway, I just might apologize for that. And then the also, I just wanted to conclude today, I was maybe thinking conclude some of the persons like um, Jewish rabbi, but then this is actually very nice. Uh, this is also uh, Greta introduced me. Uh, I don't know how you pronounce uh, Tekman, I mean, N N Nachman, Nachman Braslo, Braslo. Rabbi Nachman of Breslau. Oh, Rabbi, Rabbi Nachman, Nachman of Breslau. Nachman of Breslau. Okay. So, yeah, so that's a chair of the, the like poem a little that, book that I enjoy. That I gave you. Right. Yes. And then the, I quote Dalman also from the beginning, especially the very last one, maybe I will, maybe, well, I will just read the parts that I felt that was very 
Nice. And then so that will be like a conclusion for today, if it's okay. And uh, so he, sa he says, no, a person walks in life on a very narrow bridge. The most important thing is not to be afraid. The highest peace in a peace between opposites. If you remember this, the next time you meet someone who makes you uncomfortable, instead of uh, heading for the nearest exit, you will find ways for the two of you to get along. To be a person of truth, be swayed neither by approval nor disapproval, work at not needing approval from anyone, and you will be free to be who you really are. Develop a good eye, always looking for good, will bring you to the truth. The truth is a light by which to find your way out of darkness. Turn it on. If you believe that you can damage, then believe that you can fix. If you believe that you can harm, then believe that you can heal. So thank you very much for today, for joining us, and uh, have a good night. And hope uh, you have a great time thank you. and uh, thank you. also please uh, once again please support the the efforts of the movie and then uh so thank you again for joining us okay. it was very nice tk thank you nice yeah thank you so much yeah okay <laughs> bye bye